normally it's the Macs that have problems with the projectors, but you can see I'm going to do a workaround here with my, with my slides. Um, but, um, and actually it's very good to follow Isabel. Uh, Isabel was too modest to say it, uh, but we've uh, worked together in the past with a startup that she uh, mentions is um, a startup that I've come from. So um, you might be aware of a company called Fordell. So in terms of my background, um, I was one of the founders at Fordell, um, maker of API gateways. Uh, we uh, were initially based in Ireland uh, and then worldwide. And uh, Fordell was acquired uh, by Axway in 2012. So for um, uh, people who are aware of that, that kicked off um, a chain of dominoes where a lot of the uh, gateway manufacturers, a lot of the API management uh, vendors were then acquired one by one. And it became almost like a feeding frenzy or game of musical chairs in terms of all the acquisitions. So you know, our, our competitors like Mashery and Layer 7 and so on uh, were then uh, also acquired after us. And it, as I say, the kind of domino effect. Um, as Matty said, I'm, I'm based in Boston, uh, originally from Ireland. And, a long time ago, um, you know, Isabel talked about the past as well. Um, I wrote a book uh, back when we called these things REST Web Services. Um, so um, I agree with Isabel that um, in the past people had a, uh, a different meaning of the, of the word APIs, but you'd often hear people say, well, APIs are not a new thing. Uh, we've been doing APIs for a long time. Uh, and in fact, it's almost like a memo went around at one point saying, you know, these things that we're calling REST web services, we're now going to call them APIs. Um, but of course, there's more to it than that um, in, t in terms of what they enable. Um, there's also a lot of other follow-ons uh, from what Isabel talked about as well um, that I'll be talking about. But here's, here's the agenda. So again, you'll have to, for people coming in, you'll have to excuse the uh, showing in this PowerPoint mode. But if I blow it up to full screen, you'll only see a, a letterbox uh, in, in the middle. Um, but I'll be talking about B2B. So Isabel talked about how APIs are used by the end consumer. So how they're used, whether that consumer is uh, an end user with an app or even, as, as she said, a cow. Um, but um, I'll be talking also about the B2B angle as well. So how are APIs used in business? How are businesses succeeding uh, with APIs as well? Um, there's a lot of um, discussion around APIs. There's big conferences like, like this where we all talk about APIs. Um, and there's obviously a lot of hype. Um, but there's also a lot of, you know, real business being done with APIs. And I think sometimes uh, people um, might think, you know, potentially it's, it's a lot of hype, but th there's a lot of real business being done as well. I'll talk about security. As I mentioned, my background is in security. Um, uh, using a case study, it's actually a connected car case study as well as it happens. Again, drawing on, on a thing that Isabel mentioned. And then pulling some strategies out as well from it. So in terms of B2B, um, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, predictions around B2B. Um, you know, here I take one coming from Gartner. So my own background as well you know, it, it is, is actually with B2B. So I work for uh, an EDI company. For, so people um, who are not familiar with EDI, that was all around moving structured documents around, uh, moving purchase orders around, moving price catalogs around. So suppliers would um, send their catalog um, to people who are ordering from them. The shops ordering it would send in the price catalog or send in a purchase order back and reference the price catalog. When you ship something, you'd send these shipping notifications around. Really, it, it, in one way, it's the most boring thing you, you could do um, in that it's just like moving a structured document around. Um, but when you think about it, you know, that's what's enabling commerce, and that's what's enabling uh, digital innovation. Uh, and in the past, we used technologies like Edifact, if people are aware of that. Um, we used, um, even before XML, uh, we used uh, structured uh, document formats, a lot of which are still being used. Uh, then XML came along. Uh, XML, of course, was quite bloated. A lot of the standards around it quite bloated, too. Uh, and now we're on to using REST APIs. But there's a whole thread of B2B there as well. Uh, and rather than seeing it as, as, as boring uh, plumbing, uh, it, it's actually very fundamental um, to how people are making money uh, with, with APIs. And I think that's sometimes uh, overlooked. I have a slide here that I like to use from one of our partners. Um, Open bank projects. Um, I don't think the Open Bank 
folks are here, uh, but if they're not, you know, check them out on, on Twitter. Uh, we do API workshops around the world, um, which are, you know, a way for people to come and, and you know, talk about APIs like, like here. Um, and, and they presented at one of our workshops, and they have a slide that I asked them, um, could, could I use? Um, but this is a very nice slide because it does show the upward curve of APIs that I think you're obligated to use at a, at a conference like this. But it also has a very nice way of talking about how APIs have been adopted. So especially with banks, so banks that would be naturally conservative, um, in the early days of the web, they would talk about, um, you know, why do we really need a website? So in the early days, banks might have put out a website, and that website would be like a brochure and maybe show the directions to banks and, you know, information about the bank. But there wasn't kind of the, 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 um, the realization there about why why it's really important. It was more like, well, other people have a website, so we have to put one up. Now, people are talking about websites, so we should put a website up. Um, but it wasn't a direct channel. But that quickly changed to, of course, we have a website and are doing meaningful things with it. Uh, and, of course, that grew from there. So I like this because it fits it in with APIs. So from 2010 onwards, it was like, well, why do we need an API? So a bank, let's say, might put out an API, but they might be putting out an API because other banks have done it. They've seen people at conferences talk about APIs. They know APIs are a hot technology. But if you really corner them and say, why? You know, apart from real, you know, clued in uh, innovators at the bank, they, they might not know why. Uh, and, but the people who are adopting, and I'll show some examples, the people adopting APIs now get a very good competitive advantage. Uh, and the thing I like about this slide from Open Bank is the stage of, of course we have an API, isn't there yet. Like we're not at 2015 yet. So it still is the case where um, people know they're a hot thing to do, um, but they you know, aren't at that case where of course we have an API. The thing I like about this slide as well is you can see that in 2000 people said of course we have a website. We're now 14 years after that, all of the innovation that happened. So you can imagine that from 2015 onwards, all the innovation that's left to happen around APIs um, is, is still there, but now's the time to, to build that base. So in terms of how APIs are used, so again, you know, you can, I'm not doing a Axway infomercial here and talking about customer case studies too much, but you can draw your own inferences about, um, you know, who, who I'm talking about here. But APIs are used by a lot of things, in, as Isabel said, in, in our regular lives. Um, so making payments um, in the US, um, there's a company that's now called Sofcard. Um, until recently, they were called Isis uh, and had to uh, change their name in a hurry recently. Um, in fact, um, you know, we were uh, at, the, at their conference recently and uh, while well, they were still called Isis and they were making jokes about uh, uh, go, telling your family you're going away for an Isis uh, event. Um, but um, now they're called Sofcard, but it's about mobile payments uh, with NFC, but as you're uh, swiping your card, um, it's actually making API calls out. So you as the end user aren't thinking, oh, today I'm going to use an API for payment, but instead you're using the app and the app's using the API. Smart meters as well. I'm actually going to be at the, the ThingMonk uh, Business of IoT conference later this week in London, and you know, a lot of smart meters also have APIs, and, and I'll use some examples later too. And, and of course, cars as well. And, and different ways of interacting with the cars, including smartwatches. Um, the thing I like about um, where APIs are going is they used to be tied with mobile apps. So if you said, well, why do you have an API? Oh, it's to enable mobile apps. Now we're gone post-mobile, and APIs are taking off beyond just mobile. So smart meters with APIs, cars with APIs, different types of clients, including watches. Um, and I, I think that also speaks to that upward curve. So as I mentioned, we do um, API workshop events, and one of them was we had a speaker from Ascent. So Ascent, if people aren't aware, is one of the largest um, electricity companies in the Netherlands. And they have a very successful API um, that's at api.ascent.nl. So if you uh, type in this or get a copy of the slides, you can see uh, one of the things their API does, actually this is a SOAP endpoint to it, one of the things that our API does is it gives you the location of these things, which are electrical recharging stations. So when you're driving your electric car around, you need to know where is the electric recharge station. 
um, Ascent want people to know where it is because they aren't the only people uh, with these recharging stations. They want you to find the Ascent one, use it, and then they get the money from that. Um, they have uh, fixed stations, they have ones that move around, um, but they have an open API. And so, you know, one of the things Isabel mentioned was smart cities. And the Amsterdam.nl website, the city um, of Amsterdam website, has a mashup that shows you where these uh, smart, or where these um, uh, car recharging stations are. And the way it does that is by mashing up uh, these API calls from different vendors, not only Ascent, but others, putting them on a nice map like this, uh, and therefore you get a real-time uh, view of, of, of where they are. So that's something that's um, affecting people in real life uh, using APIs, driving business to uh, the electricity provider here. The interesting thing as well um, that they talked about is they use the same API layer, they call it an API backplane, the same APIs are used uh, to produce um, information about how you're using um, electricity. So not only about how you're consuming it if you are lucky enough to have an electric car, uh, but also from within your home uh, through smart meters to know how much your lamp, how much your uh, coffee machine is, is using electricity as well. All of this is actually coming through an, an API layer. Uh, again, the person doing all this stuff is not thinking, oh, I'm using an API today. It's almost like APIs are um, taken for granted that are enabling all of this. Um, we also see in the US um, an example here, another app that goes, calls through APIs. Again, you know, providing uh, information about car um, service information and so forth. So APIs are also um, uh, helping uh, uh, fuel uh, uh, cars as well. And, and another example that I like to use as well is American Express. You know, they've, they've been very successful with their digital channel. Um, we see um, in Axway, um, a lot of the people we're dealing with have a title of digital, so digital service groups, uh, chief digital officer. The whole idea of digital coming above APIs, mobile, cloud, and social. Um, so not really just talking about APIs, but talking about digital in general. Uh, and one of the things they've done which is very nice is um, enable what they call pay with points. So you can pay for things with American Express points. So if you've uh, run up a lot of American Express points, you can pay for Uber rides with them. You can pay for meals at McDonald's. And you can even pay for American Express taxi rides um, in the back of the taxi. That's actually a screenshot of the, um, uh, in the back of a New York taxi where you uh, pay for the ride, you can say, I'm going to use American Express membership rewards points to pay for this ride. These are all calling APIs in the background. Um, when you're paying uh, in the taxi, you're calling an API. Uh, again, the end user doesn't think, oh, I'm going to use an API now. Uh, but the key thing about this is, obviously, security is important. Um, the response time is important. You don't want to be sitting in the back of the taxi for more than a few seconds waiting for this thing to go through. Um, so all of this um, brings into play, you know, questions around that. So, so getting on to security, um, one of the questions I'm sometimes asked is like, have there been any actual security breaches of APIs? I'm sure people here who live and breathe APIs know about it, but there have been some. And about this time last year, there was one from Buffer. The funny thing about Buffer is we in Axway actually use Buffer. Uh, Buffer is a way of like buffering up um, tweets are um, other type of social media posts so that you can, for example, send them over the weekend. Um, so you're not sending out a whole bunch of tweets at once, but instead you're buffering them up. And the interesting thing that happened to Buffer was that um, they're using API keys with, with OAuth, um, so the client IDs, uh, client secret, um, that was compromised. Actually, it was embedded in their code. Code was in GitHub, and the attack was more a social engineering attack was to get their code from GitHub and find the um, client secret and client ID in the code. Uh, but based on that, they were able to tweet on behalf, for example, of airlines. So you got these types of bizarre tweets saying, you know, from an airline about not losing weight by eating a, a special fruit. Um, now, the interesting thing about this from security, and I know Dave Berlin and other people will be focusing just on security, but it's interesting because when this happened, the instinct for people was to just say, oh, someone's got our Twitter password, and I need to um, change the Twitter password. 
So you went and changed the Twitter password and the tweets kept happening. Uh, and the reason for that is because you'd given permission to Buffer to tweet on your behalf. So they are using the Twitter API on your behalf, which is with OAuth, so you've given that um, scope effectively to, to Twitter or to, to Buffer. So by you changing your Twitter password, they still have the ability to do that. So it's a case where I think people um, are one step away from the API, um, an app or a service is using the API on your behalf, and what happens if that app or service is compromised? So it's a, it's a new way of thinking about security, going beyond just have a strong password. And this is you know, one thing that I know, um, you know we, we, we also talk a lot about um, with customers. Um, and there have been others as well. I think one of the interesting ones that I often draw attention to is what happened uh, to Snapchat. Um, so, you know, they're self-dominated for wearable technology, but also for like anything which uses APIs. Um, but in Snapchat's case, what they did was they um, had an API, and one of the things their API did, and still does, is it will go through your address book, get the phone numbers and the contact information from your address book, and it will tell you if they have a Snapchat account. So it'll helpfully put a little icon beside people in your address book. Are they using Snapchat? Yes, yes, yes. So that's useful. But it turns out that you could write a script which would go through every possible phone number, every possible email address, and see, do they have a Snapchat account? And in that way, basically, you ran the script for long enough, and you got all the contact details of everyone who uses Snapchat. Uh, and the interesting thing from a point of view of a vendor like ourselves who sells API gateways and API management is if you have API management in place, that can't happen because at the very least you'll notice this gigantic spike of unusual traffic from one client. Like one client doesn't have every possible phone number um, in, the, in their app or on their phone. Uh, so this type of spike would be very, um, very um, obvious. Um, so that's one thing that API management gives you, you know, if people are you know, wondering about the benefits. Uh, but also the other thing I thought was interesting was when you had the um, SSL related uh, breaches earlier this year, uh, the people patched often the uh, websites. Um, so for like Shellshock and so forth, people patched their websites, but they often didn't patch their API layer. So that was an oversight that might have come under a different part of the organization. Uh, so in the case of Yahoo, for example, they were attacked through their API layer. Uh, so the websites were, were patched, the APIs were not. Um, so again, it's something I think that organizations are realizing that APIs are a thing and they have to, uh, to manage those. So that's you know, a little bit about security. Um, I'm gonna use an example here from a webinar we did um, about the deployment at BMW. So if you can get a copy of the slides or you're very good at uh, typing fast, you can um, uh, view the, the webinar here. But BMW is a, a nice example. It brings in connected car and APIs. Um, I, I like the fact as well, it also brings in the connected watch. Um, so this is a Samsung Galaxy Gear app. It actually, the, the app, the watch app connects to the phone and the phone connects to the API. So the, the, the watch is not calling the API directly. And the other thing is, the, and you'll see on the next slide, the API isn't being exposed by the car, uh, but it's being exposed by you know, BMW as, as the service provider and they connect to the car. Uh, but the watch app is interesting because it's, it, I actually think this is an example of a watch app that you would actually use. Uh, because to look at the range, you'd say, well, is my car charged up enough now to get me home? You'd look at your watch and find that out. It, it actually does seem like a, a useful use case. Uh, it gives you the range um, on your car, how far. So if you're at the office and you know you need to get home. Um, it also tells you if the car is locked or unlocked. Uh, it's a bit blurred here, but you'd see a lock. It also gives you the time as well, which is a very innovative uh, feature for a, for a watch app. Um, but the, the thing about um, the app as well, and as, as a total side point, this is a Galaxy Gear. And recently, um, Apple came out with their Apple Watch. And one of the apps they showed was the, um, the uh, Apple Watch app for BMW. And of course, people go crazy about this. And I was thinking, but haven't they had an app for Samsung Gear for a while now? And nobody went crazy about that. But then it was pointed out to me that Apple, Apple or BMW drivers 
they use Apple products. They don't care about like the Samsung Galaxy Gear. Um, so I think that to, to the earlier point that was made, there's kind of a luxury kind of convenience thing there. Um, but kind of delving into this a little bit more, so this is getting a little bit into the technology. Um, but the, the neat thing about this is it actually uses OAuth. Um, so OAuth, for people not uh, familiar with it, OAuth allows you to allow an app, allow a service to do things on your behalf. So the auth in OAuth is not authentication, as people I think, think often think it is. It's authorization. So you're saying, I'm going to authorize the app to do certain things with the car on my behalf. Like, let's say, unlock the car turn on the lights, and so on. Um, as you can see, as I mentioned, um, the app is not directly calling an API in the car. This is all um, effectively the, the, the um, BMW infrastructure back there. Um, but the nice thing about this uh, that I think was really, really neat, and again, you can watch the webinar to find out more about it. It's with our partner, IC Consult, as well, who did a lot of the um, implementation there in Germany. But the nice thing about it was they actually took OAuth scopes and mapped them to things you can do with the car. So it's the BMW i car, the electric cars. And what they did was that they said, you know, we're going to have scopes for the things you can do with the car. So for people familiar with scopes in OAuth, they can be quite um, academic in terms of a scope might be, um, let's say, uh, an API call you can do, or a scope might be you know, some action you can do on, on a resource. In, in this case, they said a scope will be you can open the doors. A scope would be you can open the trunk or the boot. Um, a scope would be you can turn on the lights. So you give access to the app to do those things. And that opens up a whole lot of interesting use cases, real life use cases, like if people are familiar with valet mode. So valet mode, if you're you know, a BMW driver and you're getting your car valeted, you can, um, with the app, put your car in valet mode, and that means you've enabled the scopes which are to drive the car below a certain speed, to turn off the ignition, to lock the car, but you can't open the, the trunk or the boot. So what happens is you put your valuables, your laptop, tablet, or whatever, in the boot of the car, you put it in valet mode, the person goes and parks your car. If they try to open the boot, they force it open in some way, you get an alert. Because they've hit an OAuth scope that they weren't um, supposed to hit. And it's, it's, for a technical person, it's amazing that that's mapped to OAuth. Because as the person with your car, you're not thinking, oh, I'm going to change the OAuth scopes now. Instead, it's, it's, you know, you're interacting with a car. Um, so in terms of strategies for success as kind of takeaways, because I see Mehdi has the, the countdown here. Um, I just have three of these. Um, this is getting back into like API management. You know, I've already talked about security, but I think security is almost a taken for a given. But again, the reason I use the BMW case study is security can also be a um, can also be an enabler. Um, it's not just we're blocking the bad guys like in the case of Snapchat. It's also you're enabling people to uh, interact with systems like like with with um, the OAuth scopes example. Um, so one thing is self-service. So again, you know, a bit of Axway product placement here. But it is very important that when you put an API out there, you make it easy for people to sign up to use the API. You can't just assume people are going to use it. Um, so that's signing up. Very small writing here. But are you going to enable automatic enrollment? Do you have some workflow for enrollment? You need people to actually use the API. Um, another thing is in-place testing. You know, people expect this often in an API portal. Uh, there's vendors, SmartBear, um, I know are here, um, that specialize you know, in just this thing, you know, testing your APIs. Um, but it's important to give developers a way to test the API, to create the traffic, to simulate the clients, and, and so on. Uh, and then finally, um, it's a kind of lighthearted pattern, but this is the pattern we talk about here, is, is the, what we call the API mullet pattern. But it's where you put a gateway in place, and if you're familiar with a mullet haircut, which I realize not everybody is familiar with, you have the uh, kind of simple, tidy-ish piece in the front, which is a nice REST interface. And behind your gateway, you have this mess of other stuff. It could be EDI, SOAP, JMS, files. And developers don't need, they only see the front. They don't need to care about what's behind. 
Uh, and it could be a kind of lightweight ESB that's using this. Um, and it's not a pattern peculiar to Axway. You know, all, all the vendors in here, I think, it, it's a good way to, and certainly for API management vendors, the good way to think about um, the deployment. So I've hit the end, and uh, one thing is, uh, if you're around tomorrow to catch the API management workshop, uh, you'll notice my name is different on that. It's Mark with a C, O'Neill with one L, but it's still the same person, and I'll be aided by my colleagues from, from Maxwell. It's actually the French version of me. Um, uh, and that may or may not be the right time, but, but look it up. Um, it, it's tomorrow. Thank you, Mark. Thank Thanks you very much. much. Yeah, some of Franklish into the yeah. uh, API days. We have time for one question for Mark. Yeah, from another Mark. Uh, thanks, Mark. Just w wondering, with the um, strategies for su success, the in-place yeah. testing, yeah. have you been able to, uh, is there any analytics that you're able to show maybe amongst Axway clients where those, that, uh, those customers who are using in-app testing whether they're going on to build more commercially viable applications than those developers who, or those providers who don't offer that sort of in, yeah, in app testing? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, and, and again, at the workshop tomorrow, we'll actually be showing, like, literally the, um, the blinking lights and the speeds and feeds of, of the data going through. Um, I think it, by having in-app testing, you can, um, you, you can find problems before they are notified to you by end users. So you can uh, test for the usual usage of your API. You can ramp up the, the usage. Um, you can anticipate issues before it's basically a customer or a client telling you about it. Um, I think also, when you put an API, so I talked about the API mullet pattern. When you put an API in front of a backend system, you're often using the system in different ways than how it was originally designed for. Um, so let's say you're putting messages on a queue, something is reading them, um, so you, you can simulate that, and, and I think that helps uptake. In the US recently, we had Black Friday, and so a lot of our customers in the retail area had done testing beforehand to make sure that those types of spikes uh, could be accommodated. And in fact, Cyber Monday yesterday, we have a big customer that issues um, gift codes. So that's often a thing that people buy online. And um, so it, it, again, it's simulating so that you find the problem before a customer is saying, like in that example, you know, I'm sitting in a taxi cab and how come the payment's not going through, you know. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thanks, Applause.